Welcome to episode three. Last time we ended with the end of World War I in November of 1918. For the next 20 years, that's what we call the interwar period before you got right to the cusp of World War II in the late 1930s and when the United States got involved in 1941. But what happened in those, those uh, 20 years uh, in that gap? On the one hand, you had a lot of technology development, but on the other side, the United States kind of reverted to its traditional position of being isolated from national politics. We weren't worried about having a strong standing military. All of this equipment we bought and all these men we had mobilized to fight World War I, we essentially got rid of most of that or as much as we could. And we went back to this idea of spending very little money on, on military development. Um, how did that impact us and our story? Well. One piece that we didn't mention just yet is that after Congress had provided that $640 million for aviation in 1917, the United States Army, what was later the, called the Army Air Service, decided they needed an organization to essentially figure out what to do with all that money. We needed someone to manage that, the process of what we now call acquisition. You know, well, we've got a lot of money, now we need to buy some airplanes. We need people to manage those programs. We need people to decide what airplanes to buy. We need organizations to do research and development to make better airplanes and put all that together. So the Army looked around the country and decided, well, where are we going to put this new organization, this engineering division, to do all of these different functions? They ended up picking Dayton, Ohio. Well, why Dayton? Well, there's a practical reason where if you look at kind of a map of American industry, Dayton was very much at the heart of all that. Um, and we, in fact, had a lot of technology development, a lot of factory right here in, the, in, uh, right here in Dayton doing all these things. So it did make sense from a logistics standpoint, but it did help that the Air Service's head of their equipment division, the person who was deciding what equipment that they needed to buy was from Dayton, a man named Edward Deeds. So he had suggested to the group that was looking at this that they check out Dayton and the facilities they had here. Well, to make a long story short, we ended up with an organization here just outside of downtown Dayton called McCook Field. It was a very small field that was the home to this engineering division that was going to do all of these things associated with the buying of airplanes, the acquisition process, the research and development, all of those different steps. And so they came online just in December of 1917. So they were operational during that last year of the war, which they helped contribute to, contribute technologies, but also managing the um, production of the airplanes like the DH-4 behind me. They specialized in doing research and technology development in all different areas you associate with airplanes. Aeronautics, structures, uh, propulsion, uh, that's engines, propellers, even parachutes, all these different bits and pieces, materials that they were able to put together to help us make better airplanes. Well, you'll notice that one piece of our story is missing from that list I just gave you, and that's cameras. They weren't working on cameras at that time. That was the province of the Signal Corps, which aviation had originally been under. And so that was being handled elsewhere at Langley in Virginia and at, uh, at a school up in Cornell in New York, not at McCook Field. Well, once the war ended and the Army was trying to consolidate all of its work in order to save money, that piece was actually brought to Dayton to join the rest of it with McCook Field. And here's where we get into some of our, um, our main characters for the story. Um, we didn't have this photographic lab at the, uh, in early of 1919, but um, there was a, a man that, if you know any aviation history, uh, that should sound familiar, General Billy Mitchell. He's known kind of as the father of the independent Air Force, and that was his big thing. He had been in charge of the Air Forces that we were using out in uh, Europe and World War I, so he had a lot of experience, but then he was also a zealot, really, when it came to the importance of air power and how that should be separated out from the Army as its own independent fighting force, like it is now as the United States Air Force. So one of his ideas he, um, that came from his experience having commanded those forces was that aerial photography was very valuable for a military leader. This is something that an air service, if it was independent, could provide to the military to help it be more effective. When he got back to the United States, he saw that there wasn't an organization doing this to the level that he thought it should. So in 1919, he got this idea that, yes, we're going to stand up a laboratory with all of our other laboratories in Dayton specifically to, to develop technologies associated with aerial photography. He was on a trip down to um, Florida and bumped into a guy that he had arguably heard of, a, uh, a young lieutenant named George Goddard. He taps this guy on the shoulder, he sees him kind of mounting a camera to an airplane and says, hey, uh, Lieutenant, uh, I've got an assignment for you. I'm going to send you up to Dayton to go start a photographic lab. 
Well, George there was uh, a little bit taken aback. He was under the impression he was going to learn to be a pilot because that was really what he wanted to do. Uh, but instead, you know, when the number two guy the, in your, the air service tells you you're going to go take this job, well, you got to go take that job. Uh, so fortunately for us, Goddard does take the assignment. Well, who was Goddard? He was actually a, uh, uh, he had been born in Britain, visited the United States as a young man and liked it so much he wanted to stay. Uh, it was a very artistic sort. He was actually working as a commercial artist when the United States got into World War I. Um, and he decided he was gonna go sign up for the Signal Corps to do you know, technical drawing or art or something. He didn't really have a good idea. Well, so he hopped a train from where he was living in Chicago to go to New York to uh, where he was going to enlist. On the way, he bumped into a pilot um, for the air service, uh, supposedly on the bar cart of the train. And he, you know, he asked him, hey, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to sign up for the Signal Corps. And the pilot, of course, being how pilots are, says, why would you want to go do that? Go do something exciting, be a pilot. And Goddard's like, well, okay, sure. He had actually, uh, he had flown on an airplane once. Uh, he had met a female pilot named Ruth Law and he had seen her doing acrobatics and things. He's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. So he changed his mind, wanted to go be a pilot. Well, once he got to New York, um, those planes didn't quite work out. He got put into aerial photography instead. And so he spent the last few months of the war learning to the all the processes associated with aerial photography, but the war ended before he was actually deployed overseas. He was so good at it, he had been actually employed as an instructor there at the schools. Um, and so he had this bit of a reputation. So that's probably how Billy Mitchell knew him when he assigned him up to McCook Field. <music>